here to share thoughts together. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I mean, the, the nurses, I want to say this. Any, is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Absolutely nothing. Because Sarah was able to, she had passed her menopause and she was able to have a baby. So is anything too hard for the Lord? I want you to go to the example confident that God has already conquered for you. So if he come, we are praying for you. And then when we go to Zechariah 4, 6, there's a very promising thought there. Say, it's not by power or by might, but by my spirit. So in our spiritual lives, in our spiritual life, in our economic lives, God wants to tell us that it is not by our own physical human effort. It's not, it's not by our knowledge, but by his spirit. He can do the impossible for us. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the privilege to be in your presence this morning. Father, we thank you that even though we are so unworthy, you are working day and night to bring us back into the family fold. We thank you for this grace. Father, this physical body of mine feels so inadequate, just like Moses felt. But I pray, Father, that you turn this physical body into your, into your temple and speak through me to your people. Bless us on this special Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I guess we don't have too much time on our hands, but I want us to share a thought together. You know, if there's any single event in the lives of the disciples as they work with Jesus, that was so life-threatening. When the, spirit, the, the disciples really felt that they were so close to death, when they felt they were face to face with death, when they felt that death was really breathing hot, 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 uh, listen, breath on their, on their scroll. It was during the time when Jesus calmed the storms. You know, it, for right from the time that the disciples started walking with Jesus, till even the very last minute in the Garden of the Gethsemane, most of them had their own lingering or solid doubts. Otherwise, Peter would not have drawn a sword to protect the master and cut off somebody's ear. Turn with me to the book, uh, the Gospel according to John. Anybody who gets it can read. John 11, 8. And you see that the disciples, even though they walked with Jesus for such a long time, they still had lingering doubts about what Jesus was capable of doing. Anybody get it for me? John 11, 8. Now, before Jesus went to resurrect Lazarus, this is, this is a some kind of doubt that people express, the disciples. Anybody got it? Please read it for us. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there. When Jesus wanted to go and resurrect Lazarus, that is something, something that one of the disciples said. But Jesus, what is this? No, a short while ago, but the last time we were there, these people wanted to stone so you to death, and you still want to go back. It's an expression of doubt as to what God could do if Jesus could be in control of the situation. Now let's listen to what uh, this guy said, uh, Thomas, John eleven sixteen. He explicitly expressed some kind of frustration. Okay, if that is it, okay, so let it be. Let's go and die then. We definitely, when we go, these people are going to kill us. Anybody get it? Read it for me. John eleven sixteen. Then Thomas called Didymus said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So that was it. They felt that Jesus could not be in control of the situation. And so we all think sometimes. Sometimes there are life crises, and they'll begin to feel that, well, this is way out, outside this perimeter to be able to control. Now, when we read this text about Jesus calming the storm, right after that event, they landed on the other side of the Lake of Galilee. And they were confronted by a very vicious, violent, aggressive, and dangerous lunatic. You know, naturally you would have expected the disciples to express some misgivings, express some concern as to whether Jesus should confront the situation. But if you read the text, there's no expression of doubt. None of the disciples expressed any, kind, any form of panic or any kind of misgiving as to what, whether Jesus could be on top of the situation. They had been toughened by the storms. Now, you can just imagine how it would feel like to be in a small boat on a dark, cold night. And then, all of a sudden, you are hit by a very violent windstorm. 
And then you try to use all your experience, every single experience, every single survival strategy that is a fisherman, you have learned to survive on the, on the rough seas. And none of them seems to work. And then water keeps gushing into your boat. And then you are all, you are almost being blown apart by the winds. And you keep hanging to the walls of the boat. And water keeps gushing in. You begin to bail out the water, but your effort is not strong enough to contain the situation. And then you feel that really you are sinking. That is what happened to the disciples. Most of the disciples had had long time experience working as fishermen. We don't have time, but when we read from the book of the gospel, I'm going to Mark chapter 1, verse 16. 9 to 19, we realize that most of the disciples, at least uh, uh, Simon and his brother Andrew and John, uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were fishermen. That's what the, the, the predominant occupation that was being carried out in that time. They were fishermen. And obviously, their life had been seasoned by rough experiences on the sea. They knew. How? To even look up in the skies and predict that oh, the weather is going to be okay or not. And they knew how to survive on the sea. Now I tell you, before they set off, if they knew that there was going to be a windstorm, I guess they would have expressed some doubt. Now, I, we don't have time, but it's funny. Who actually initiated this, this, this idea that they should go to the other side of the lake? Now when we read, it was Jesus himself who initiated that thought. Mm. It wasn't the idea from any of the disciples. Actually, they had told all day, ministering to crowds and large crowds of people who had come to listen to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus had told them about the kingdom by using parables. The parable of the seed and the sower. Seeds that fell into the ground, some went into rocky places. Those that fell into very good soils. And those that fell by the, by the roadside and got eaten up by birds. He had used parables and spent a long time ministering to them. At the end of the day, both Jesus and the disciples were just worn out. They were terribly exhausted. So they all needed a rest. But it was Jesus who initiated the thought that they should go to the other side. Now I want to tell you, ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus knew that there was going to be a storm? What do you think? He knew. Definitely he knew. The disciples just relied on their own vain Vain experience as fishermen. They couldn't predict it. Jesus obviously knew about it. But the disciple was hungering for a rest. So on the oh, that's a good idea. They just pulled pad into the boat and they started sailing. From the beginning, it was a very beautiful weather. It was so calm on the sea. Then all of a sudden they got hit by that wind storm. Sometimes Things in our life seem to be going on jolly fine. And that it appears like we are in full and efficient control of our lives. It all appears like we can cope with anything that comes along the way. Sometimes life seems to be going on so well that we, we really don't care if Jesus, God, is asleep or not. In fact, most of the time, probably we might want Jesus, God, to be asleep so that he doesn't kind of interfere in things going on with well in our life. And oftentimes, it really feels good that we can live our, live our lives the way we want to live it, without any form of inter spiritual interference whatsoever. But then, the storms may come, and they may come in various shapes, and shapes, and colors, and forms. Perhaps it's an emotional storm, a cherished, long-time relationship that, is, that breaks up, or the death of someone who is ever so dear to you. It could be a very nasty misunderstanding between you and a friend or a work colleague. It could be some form of unfulfilled expectations. Perhaps the storm hits in the form of a financial storm. Unexpectedly finding yourself without a job and being on an unsuccessful, frustrating job hunting spree. Facing foreclosure. House that you have ever invested everything in. You lose in a clicking second. Or you may lose a lifetime, lifetime saving for, on some investment that didn't go through. Perhaps the storm comes to devastate your health life or some, the life of somebody who is ever so close to you. Perhaps 
Your storm comes to shatter your spiritual life. Sometimes we begin to lose the grip that we have, we have on our spiritual life. And then we may begin to look for meaning and purpose in our spiritual calling. Why am I Christian? Why is it that even others who are not Christians are being far better than I am? Why is it that people who are not, who don't care to hoots about God seem to be having their life going on jolly well for them? And then we begin to wonder if our spiritual calling is really something that we should die for. We may find ourselves facing serious spiritual crisis of faith. And then we are just confused. Whatever form your storm may come, I want to assure you today that God knew the storm was going to come. It was going to hit. Now when the storm hit, the disciples tried to do everything possible that they could, they could do. They put in all their human experience. I'm sure they just probably thought, well, we shouldn't bother Jesus with this. And then when they really felt that, man, this is out of our control. We just cannot do much about this. We need help. They went searching for Jesus. When they went groping in the dark, cold night, they found the master comfortably asleep. And then someone said, Master, don't you care that we perish? Jesus cares that we perish. When we are perishing, Jesus feels it because he was there when we were created. Even he says, right from our mother's womb, before we were even born, he knew and he cared about us. Amen? Amen. So this Jesus is saying that before the storms hit, he knew about it. Now I would like to say that Jesus was human, that's why he was asleep. And this should give us some form of comfort. If he was a woman, if he felt the same feelings that we, 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 we feel as human beings, if he was so vulnerable to the, all the infirmities around us, if he felt hungry or tired and exhausted like we are, it means he can understand us when we feel tired. It means he can understand our tears when they come. We don't have time, but I want to say that sometimes life seems to tumble in. And then we begin to ask ourselves, where is the God that I serve? We begin to ask questions. Master, don't you care that we perish? Father, don't you care that my marriage is falling apart? Lord, don't you care that I've been looking for a job all these months and I need money to even get on the train to come to church? Lord, don't you care that all my friends have deserted me because of my faith? Lord, don't you care that I'm struggling in many, many ways in my life? Lord, don't you care that I have economic insecurity? Lord, don't you care that I've been looking for a partner for all these long years? Lord, don't you care that I am desperate? And Lord, don't you care that I am close to losing my grip on life? He cares. The disciple asked, Master, don't you care that we perish? He does care. In fact, when we go through the Bible, he says that God is our high priest, Jesus was our high priest. And he was he is touched by every single infirmity that we are touched with. Toughened by the storms. So Jesus calms the storms. He rebukes the elements. And now if God, the Son of Man, Jesus, could be in control of the elements, talk to the winds and get them to calm down. There is nothing that else that Jesus cannot have control with. Nurses, I want to tell you, if it is God's wish, and I know it's a ministry, God knows that you are here to have a special ministry and reach out to people who are suffering physically. And if it is His wish, then you're going to pass and you're going to excel far more to your own expectation because He cares. Now, we have storms that really toughen us up. This morning we read this text, but I want us to read it again. Second Corinthians 11. 26 to 28. And we hear about one man who had his own storms. In fact, coincidentally, he was hit literally by literal storms. So let's read about uh, Paul, how he got his storms, and how he even he even felt proud of the storms that came his way. Second Corinthians 11, 26 to 28. Anybody just read it for us. Anybody can read it. 
I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have been gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. And if you are to go up, he says, I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more. And I have never I've, I've been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Lord. Three times I was whipped by the Romans. And once I was torn. I have been in three shipwrecks. And once I spent 24 hours in the water. In water. Now this is a man. Who was serving God? Sometimes you may ask, but God, I'm serving you. Why all these storms? We need them sometimes to toughen us. What are your storms? Financial? Spiritual? Emotional? Social one? God does care about each one of them. Jesus cares. Now, when life seems to tumble in, Jesus is always ever close by. He only needs us to shout and say, Master, save me for I perish. And he will say, peace be still. There is a song sung by Linda Randall. It's a very beautiful song. I wish we could all sing it together. My brother Mark, could you come around? We are going to sing the song. But before then, it says, For God of the mountains is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, you make it right. And the God of the good times is still God in the bad times. The God of the day is still God in the night. Those of you who know how to sing it, please sing along with us. At the end of it all, we are all going to sing it. But if you know how to sing, feel free to sing along. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. And you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But then things change and you're down in the valley. The 
that when things are going bad, God is still in control. And God will be best when life seems to be going fine. As much as he is with us when life seems to be humbling you. I want us to go home. And whatever our storms may be, when they do hit, let us not forget. Jesus is just close by. And we need to scream out to him. Father, save me for I perish. And he will never ever fail anyone who offers such a cry. May our life be richly blessed by this thought. And for the fact that we have the whole monarch of this whole universe who is ever willing to come down to the point that if he even needs to interfere with the, the, the smooth run of the elements just for the sake of even a single person here is willing to do that. May his name be praised. Amen. Amen.